All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm Todd Periston, uh, CEO and co-founder of Era Software. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk to you all about observability data pipelines today. Um, a relatively new concept kind of from a nomenclature perspective in observability. Um, we're also seeing some folks uh, call them telemetry pipelines, um, but still an emerging space and kind of wanted to talk about our perspective on what it means to build it yourself versus buying one of the emerging technologies on the market. Uh, so a little bit of background on me. Uh, I previously co-founded a company called Influx Data. So we built the uh, Influx DB time series database, um, as well as a bunch of other tools like uh, Telegraph and um, observability, observability tools um, to kind of manage time series data at scale. Um, that, that product interestingly started off as, as a SaaS product. We shifted to kind of an open source model. So, you know, I've been in the observability space in one form or another for about a decade. Um, and then went to a company called Pivotal after that and worked on uh, observability for the Cloud Foundry platform as a service. Um, started ERA in 2019, mid to late 2019. Uh, and we've been focusing on uh, time series and observability use cases again. Um, yeah, and this is something I, I love talking about. So happy happy to chat with anybody here uh, at any point. Just feel free to reach out to me. Um, love talking about the space. So one of the things that we've been looking at as we um, you know as we talk to customers as we go to market, we think about how we're positioning our own products. So our, our primary focus in the observability space has been um, has been log management. That was a place where when when we were starting Era two and a half three years ago. Um, we saw a lot of opportunity for innovation and disruption, uh, primarily because the data volume of logs is so huge, um, and the the desire to keep uh, keep logs around for long periods of time and have long long retention windows is high. And there's also a lot of complexity in logs, and so they've got a lot of these really difficult properties that make it hard to manage at scale uh, versus metrics and traces, which have their own their own properties. That make them difficult to manage, but it's it, it's I think somewhat less complex than logs if you just had to focus on one. So we've been looking at logs and log management. We obviously see um, lots of customers using Splunk, lots of customers using Elasticsearch, um, and as we started looking at what does it mean to manage some of these growing data volumes, um, you know, we took some uh, an opportunity to, to survey uh, a lot of practitioners in you know in the IT world and ask a bunch of questions about observability what those folks think about uh, tooling, data volumes, data growth. Uh, and one of the places we asked some questions about um, was, you know, how, how do you think in your organization you're going to see log volumes grow kind of as a way to get, get into people's mindset about how they think about managing, you know, growth over the next few years. And so this chart here is really breaking down uh, by, by bucket, like how do, how do folks think their log volumes are going to grow year on year um, from where they stand right now. So if you kind of look at this, you, you can split the graph kind of in half. There's sort of the folks that think less than 50% and the, you know, the kind of like 10 to 50% range uh, comprises what 58% of the respondents. But it's interesting to note on the right-hand side of this graph, you know, there, there are two pretty big bars there for people who think they're going to see 50 to 100% you know, annual growth, which, you know, effectively is like doubling year over year. And then there's almost 20% of the respondents think two to five X growth. So they're, they're looking at, you know, significant growth in the, in the not too distant future. And we're already hearing from customers that are seeing tens of terabytes a day, hundreds of terabytes a day. Um, and, you know, the larger the organization, the more, the more log volume um, they're generating. And especially with the adoption of tools like Kubernetes and containers, there, there's just so many more sources for logs to come from. And so one of the things that we're seeing and kind of getting into observability pipelines a bit is uh, just storing this data is actually hard. If you actually want to do things with it, you want to pre-process it, you want to route data to multiple destinations or have um, kind of rules that decide what, what goes where, you actually need to start embracing uh, a relatively sophisticated set of technology to figure out how you manage this incoming data volume if you want to do anything with it. And then, then you still have to figure out what that storage piece looks like. So what we're really seeing is that the, the volume of, of observability data in general, and specifically logs, 
growing um, is something that's on people's minds and is becoming um, a significant problem for a lot of the existing tools. And so um, pulled this quote kind of out of our paper, um, but 79% of the folks surveyed uh, are concerned about the rising costs of observability um, and observability data management um, if we don't see some innovation in either the tools or the technologies um, that we currently have. And I think if you go back and look at the, you know, the, the, the folks that are thinking about their ingestion going up two to five X, you know, over the next year, you know, if you think about it just from like a, a hardware cost, if you, if you are imagining, say you're spending a million dollars a year on hardware to manage logs right now, you're looking at that going to two to 5 million by next year. And that's a relatively significant increase um, especially in you know, the current climate where actually a lot of folks are starting to look at cost reduction and ways that they can um, use, use fewer tools and fewer resources to manage things going forward. Um, and so this is, this is pretty interesting to me that like while lots of folks are embracing observability, there's a pretty significant um, desire to see some innovation. And so our kind of uh, viewpoint on where we're gonna see the biggest, I, I think differentiation is, the adoption of observability pipelines or telemetry pipelines. And so one of the other survey questions we put out there was really asking, have you thought about observability pipelines? Are you using them yet? Are you going to be using them yet? And so this chart here really shows kind of the, the blue bars are folks that have either deployed something or are deploying something. And then the brown and brown and brownie gray bars on the, on the right hand side are folks that are looking at um, embracing a new technology. And so it's a pretty even split. I would say it probably is about 50-50, maybe less, just, just a little bit less than half have actually uh, made the decision to implement something. And the other slightly more than half are, are evaluating now. And so, you know, it feels like looking at the data, it's something that, um, you know, is, is familiar to folks in the space, but something that still has a lot of room for um, adoption and standardization and really um, finding, finding use cases in the market at scale that I think can really drive some of this innovation that we're seeing uh, the need for in, in managing log data, observability data in general. Um, and so our, our viewpoint here is that we think the observability pipeline space is something that will continue to be important to all sizes of organizations and will become a more important part of the stack that I think people are thinking about choosing when they start to roll out observability infrastructure in their organization. And so kind of breaking it down a little bit, um, you know, you've got a lot of choices when you think about what an observability pipeline is. It can be uh, a product that you buy off the shelf and, you know, bringing up some potential competitors, you know, there's like a, a cribble of the world. You can just like take that, you know, it does a lot of the things that you might, might want. Um, their focus is on, uh, on Splunk users primarily. They, they do a lot of work there to try and help reduce the cost of Splunk. Again, Splunk is an expensive product. Cribble is also an expensive product. Um, and it, it isn't necessarily the right fit for all sizes of data, all shapes of data, and all organizations. So that's probably one end of the spectrum. And then the other is, you know, you can just grab some open source tools and you can build a processing pipeline. It can be, you know, either you manage it yourself. There are some, obviously, some cloud resources you could deploy. But there are a handful of problems that you need to think about as you're deploying an observability pipeline. And so really the first question is like, what are the problems that you, you need to solve when you're thinking about whether you wanna build or buy? So we highlighted a couple here. The first is, is the, the rate of ingestion. And this is not something that just applies to observability pipelines. This is something that applies to all observability infrastructure. And if you're looking at um, you know, using something like, I mean, it could be Splunk, it could be Elasticsearch, it could be any of these uh, log management tools, uh, the rate of ingest is something that can be a real problem, especially when you have outages and you see your um, log volume spike. So it's not uncommon for some sort of error state to cause a lot of systems to start emitting error messages simultaneously in the event of failure, and you could see your, your log volume go up 10x. And if the rate of ingestion of your, of your storage system isn't, isn't able to scale up to handle that, then you start you know, either backing up uh, writes or you start getting failures. And when you're looking at trying to, to solve uh, whatever the root cause is for an outage, that's the time you most want ingestion. 
so it's a problem on the storage side, but it's also a problem on, on the uh, on the ingestion on the observability pipeline side. If you have a system that's doing data processing, data enrichment, whatever, um, you need to make sure that that system can also handle that that burst in scale. And so it's it you know there's a bit of a trade off there because some of it may be uh, is, is there is it simply about storage and queuing inside of the observability pipeline? Is it about rate of process? Because if you've got workers that are dedicated to processing this data and they're expecting, let's say, you know, on the order of like 10 gigabytes per day and suddenly it goes to a terabyte per day, are you going to have enough resources to actually process that data in real time or is your pipeline going to start backing up um, and then you're going to actually lose visibility into that data potentially? And so rate of ingest is, is an important factor. It needs to be something that can be relatively flexible without causing you to have to deploy a bunch of like permanent resources to handle that max capacity because otherwise those are going to be sitting idle a lot of the time. So that's a relatively complex problem that's simple on the surface. Um, data transformation. So if you think about log data in particular, I mentioned this earlier, uh, it comes in a lot of different uh, formats, uh, structures. You may not even have the same fields from you know one system to another. So being able to do initial data transformation um, you know, do you standardize on a schema? Do you do a set of um, either like rewriting or, or modifying that data in flight so that you have a consistent set? But you need to think about that so that when it lands in your destination systems, it's in the format that you actually want it to be queried in. And so there are lots of different ways and different rules about how that data can be transformed. And it may not be consistent from organization to organization. So being able to have some flexible rules and flexible um, tooling so that you can do these transformations without each individual transformation having to be, you know, a new piece of code that somebody has to write or uh, a rule that somebody has to write and test and, and manage is a is a significant um, a significant part of thinking about what this observability pipeline implementation looks like. Um, data transport is another uh, thinking about you know it's not necessarily just a input output stream, there may be lots of inputs and lots of outputs, there may be um, places in the middle, like potentially dead letter queues and things like that, where where error, uh, error state data goes. So thinking about what are what's the what's the global picture of all of these different, um, you know, input output streams, and how how do they tie together? What are the rules for what gets routed where and how do those get managed? So that that's problem number three. And then the last one is really data provenance, which is something that we see a bit more of in kind of the data warehousing ETL space, um, but really just making sure that you you have some sort of way to track the flow. Like if you have data that's landing in a system, is there some way either through, um, you know, looking at uh, looking at configurations or, or configuration changes over time, figuring out where did this data come from? Does it get tagged based on source? Like, do you apply metadata to it so that you can um, know in the destination system what the origin was like. So thinking about what does that mean? Maybe you don't even care about the provenance. You just sort of want all the data to land wherever it lands. And that's fine. But it's something that needs to be considered because uh, once it passes through the, the pipeline and has been, has been touched, you sort of have missed your opportunity if you then want to need to go back and do a lot of work to, to re-tag data um, in those destination systems down the road. So each one of these things has its own concerns and considerations that you have to think about. Um, and add to the complexity of what it means to, to build an observability pipeline. And so when you start to think about your build options, so think through all those problems we talked about before, and then you kind of look at the tools that are relatively standard in, um, in the space for uh, you know, open source tools or you know, cloud, cloud managed tools, but what are the things that you can use to compose an observability pipeline. So sort of the foundation that you, you'll see most commonly is some, some sort of queuing system. Um, Kafka probably is the, the most common. Um, there's another newer one called Apache Pulsar. Um, and you know, RabbitMQ is another open source option that's been around for a while. Most of these have some <clears throat> managed offering on AWS or GCP as well. So if you're trying to build it um, on a particular cloud, you may not necessarily have to manage those pieces yourself. But the thing to keep in mind is that each of these has its own um, design trade-offs about what it means to be a queue. It's not necessarily just a single pass-through data processor. There may be topics that you have to think about and how do you, how do you handle uh, defining topics and what data sources 
go into what topics and what gets pulled from what topics and how do you actually uh, resource um, individual topics to make sure that if there's one topic that's particularly noisy, that it gets handled well. And so each of these is, is sort of designed to be a very generic message bus that may or may not necessarily fit the, the logging workloads that you're trying to, um, to approach. And then, you know, so you've kind of got those open source options. There, there are others as well. Um, I could probably fill an entire talk just going through like uh, queuing options. Um, but then you, you also have some vendor specific things like SQS on AWS or Kinesis. Um, and if you look at, you know, the design of SQS, um, it's really kind of more designed to be a, like a single really large queue that has a, a huge, huge scale of processing volume. Uh, but then there are limitations on payload sizes, uh, but it has nice things like dead letter queues, with, which Kinesis does not. So depending on how you, you want to think about, um, uh, think about those individual trade-offs that there are lots of very fine points that you have to go into thinking about the implementation of each of these as it relates to how you want to build your pipeline. And so, you know, for the queuing piece, there's a whole bunch of decisions and each one of them comes with its own uh, potential issues if, if you don't get to factor them into your decision up front. And then when you look on the, on the sort of processing side, you know, you can look to some of these, um, you know, uh, telemetry or metrics based agents. Like if you look at Logstash from Elastic, Telegraph, we built at Influx. Um, Fluent D has been around for a long time from, from treasure data and then Fluent Bit more recently um, as, as more of like an edge collector. Um, and now there's a company called Calyptia around that's formed around Fluent Bit. Uh, Vector was a, an open source Rust tool that's now part of Datadog. And each one of these has its own sets of inputs and outputs, its own internal uh, state management, um, you know, uh, I guess decisions in, in how it's architected that affect, you know, performance and, and how, how it works, how it fails. And so, you know, potentially the simplest thing can be pick a queue, pick a set of processors and you have data go into the queue and you can use these agents to pull off of, uh, Kafka, for instance, process data, and then send it to another source. It, it's fairly simple, but then there are lots of ways where, uh, that can fail. Like what happens if um, you, you have a lot of like agent management, agent configuration management that you have to do. And so as you start to actually deploy these, you'll start to see the individual characteristics of each tool that you're, you're choosing, um, you know, how it performs, how it scales, um, what are your input and output options. And, and you, you sort of have to, you end up having a, a system that's going to be the composite of the, the trade-offs that you have to choose around. And so, this works well for some folks, but it, it really ends up putting a lot of the burden on you, the, the implementer, to figure out how do you manage all of these other tools together and make it feel like a cohesive system. And if you think about you know, pushing out configuration changes, like if you've got, let's say you have uh, 100 vector agents running and you want to make a configuration change, how do, how do you manage rolling that out to 100 vectors? How do you actually... Um, you know, make sure that you don't have 99 that get updated and one that fails and is still putting data in the wrong place. So you start to think about, uh, you know, an ostensibly simple configuration of these tools, but really it starts to come with a lot of complexity. Um, and again, there are, are many, many other tools you could use for this. This is not nearly an exhaustive list, um, but the goal here is to get you to see there are lots of options um, and with each of those options come um, some some baggage that you're going to have to take on. And so things that you want to think about a little bit more broadly, as you look at the, the tools or the, the option to potentially buy something off the shelf, um, the, the simplest, the, the, I guess the first one is, how do you manage this thing? What does it look like to spin it up? What does it look like to scale it down? Uh, how hard is it to deploy in multiple places? Um, you know, is there a centralized configuration management tool? Or is that something that you have to to build a pipeline, but build your own like CI CD pipeline to do configuration management. So what is what does the operator experience look like? Um, back pressure performance. This kind of comes back to the rate of ingest problem. You know, if the pipeline itself gets to the point where it's sort of reached its maximum processing potential, uh, what happens? Does it give errors to clients? Does it have some way of buffering to disk for data that it can't process? Um, these are all like really important considerations and things that will affect your entire observability infrastructure because the pipeline now is going to become 
that leading edge of all this data being fed into the system. So just thinking about what happens, because if you start to apply you know, back pressure and give errors to clients, then, then those clients that are sending data upstream then have to have their own durability um, and state management because um, you, know, you, you never know how long an outage is going to last and how long the back pressure is going to last. So then you start having to think about what does it mean to, to have um, back pressure versus some sort of buffering or, or durability. Um, versatility uh, is sort of just in general, what, what are all the things that it can do? You know, if you look at the Fluent D versus Fluent Bit um, kind of trade off, you know, Fluent D has a lot more integrations, uh, a lot more like inputs and outputs that it supports than Fluent Bit, but Fluent Bit is much more lightweight. So it's able to do, um, again, it's kind of more targeted at edge processing, but if you needed to run uh, with a lower footprint, um, it's, it's a much more efficient tool, but again, it comes with that trade-off of it doesn't support as many native inputs and outputs. Um, so if there's something that you end up needing um, in, in one of these tools that you've chosen uh, that you don't have, you either need to, you know, build it, find someone else to add it, you know, contribute back to open source, whatever. Um, but just thinking about what are the set of inputs and outputs that you need to work with um, versus what each of these individual tools offers. And again, at this point, I feel like a lot of them support a lot of the same things. You know, if you look at um, like log stash versus vector, things like that. I think there are, there are lots of, they're, they're, they've been around for long enough that they have enough inputs and outputs that you're probably going to be well covered. Um, but you never know. There may be things like how it handles a particular type of authentication for a certain input or output um, that may not work with the, the way that your system is designed. So again, lots of little nuance to each of those things, uh, but it's an important point. Um, the next thing is sort of data manipulation. Um, what is the what are the tools that are available to you sort of within those agents um, to make changes to that data? So for instance, Vector uses um, Lua as a scripting language that allows you to to rewrite data. And I think you know Logstash has has its own. And so is that is that sufficient for you to be able to make all the changes that you want? Um, is that efficient enough for you from a compute perspective to, to be able to, to do the scale of processing that you want without having to spend a ton on hardware? Um, something that's really hard, it's really hard to know until you sort of test it at scale. So there's a lot of work there that goes into figuring out what are your goals with it as a, as a tool? Um, you know, how, how, much, how much does it give you? Uh, another piece to this sort of is configuration changes. Uh, as you're deploying, these agents sort of in a processing mesh or like a pool of workers, whatever, whatever architecture you choose, how do you deploy those configuration changes? Do you have to worry about data loss when agents restart? Um, if you need to make lots of small changes, what happens, um, you know, if you've got data sort of in an intermediate state in a pipeline, like does that data get stale and get dropped or is there some way of tagging version changes between configurations so that th th that data continues getting processed uh, before the new configuration kicks in. Um, so lots of, again, subtle nuance there, but things that you need to think about how you're going to manage this uh, from a configuration perspective. And, and also once you start to get to the point where you start putting a significant amount of processing logic in these agent configurations, now you essentially have code effectively, like, do you need to test that? Do you need to test your, your Lua inside of your agent um, to make sure that it's doing what you wanted, hasn't broken any previous um, changes, um, and and is is you know ready for production or whatever. Do you test it in staging? Again, lots of things to keep in mind there. And then the last thing to really think about is um, is error management. So you know, let's say you have a uh, an output destination that goes offline, or you know the credentials are wrong, and you've been trying to write data. Like let's say let's say it's Datadog. Let's say one of your target destinations is Datadog. Um, and somehow the API token that you're using to write or the credentials you're using um, are no longer correct. Well, now you're going to back up a ton of a ton of logs that are going to be sitting in some sort of um, intermediate state potentially, and it could be it could be a dead letter queue, um, something that's designed for these errors. But how do you get alerted when that starts to fill up? What happens when that actually becomes so big that 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 starts dropping logs. So thinking about what these error states are like, you know, is it something that has to be manually remediated? Is it something that needs to have a, a code or configuration change uh, to resolve? Um, but again, it's a relatively important concept because 
errors can happen fast and errors can cause massive amounts of data. Um, and so it's, you know, I can imagine a single configuration change could cause an entire pipeline to stop working. And then you've got potentially your entire, uh, you know, uh, real time data volume getting backed up uh, within the pipeline. And, you know, if it goes unnoticed or if it isn't, isn't designed to be able to handle some amount of scale uh, to store that data, then you're, you're looking at data loss. And so there are lots of these choices, implementation decisions that could potentially lead to um, undesirable side effects when you're thinking about um, how your pipeline operates. So again, things that you really need to do a lot to think about if you're building it yourself, things that theoretically products that you may, may look to buy have thought through and solved for you and hopefully taken away a significant amount of that burden. Um, and so getting a little bit to, to us and kind of how we think about um, observability pipelines. So we started out building um, a product called Era Search. Um, and the easiest way to think about Era Search is really um, kind of a, a rewrite, not necessarily a rewrite, uh, a competitor to Elasticsearch in the log management space. It's a totally different architecture. We wrote the entire thing in Rust. It's designed to be cloud native. Um, managed with Kubernetes. And the idea there was, you know, looking at the way, um, uh, you know, the efficiency of Elasticsearch uh, for log management isn't great, um, kind of realizing that there are a lot of properties about uh, time series data, observability data in general, that need a relatively specialized uh, storage technology to get uh, optimal efficiency. And so, again, kind of going to my background, spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff at Influx, a lot of time thinking about this stuff at Pivotal and looking at, um, at ways that we could optimize the, the storage problem for observability data and specifically log management. So we've been working on that error search product for about two years now. Um, you know, we've tested it up to about a petabyte per day of ingest on a single cluster. And so really looking for ways that we can deliver um, kind of a foundational technology for, for storing log data that makes it uh, cost effective and scalable for organizations so that the storage piece is solved. And then as we started to spend more time talking to customers and looking for that, the next set of pain points kind of leading into the storage, um, the observability pipeline uh, problem kept coming up with, with customers and conversations. And we started working on a product called Airstreams, again, uh, written in Rust and thinking a lot about uh, the efficiency um, and optimizing for these, these log log volumes that are growing and growing. Um, and so AeroStreams really is our answer to this sort of all the problems with observability pipelines that I outlined. You know, you're gonna need lots of input formats. You're gonna need uh, a high degree of durability. You're gonna need the ability to take in lots of different formats and go to lots of different places. You're gonna need the ability to have uh, dead letter queuing and visibility into uh, what's required for remediation um, as soon as you start seeing those, those error states. Um, and so AeroStreams really is a full, a fully functional observability pipeline um, presently for log data. Uh, I see a lot of use cases coming up where I think uh, metrics will also start to be uh, a factor in observability pipelines right now. Um, there, isn't, there isn't much yet that I think folks are doing from that perspective, but I think it's going to start to become a lot more common, especially as we start to see more, more desire for a correlation of logs and metrics. Um, more pre-processing, alerting, things like that, where I think logs and metrics can be, um, there, there's some uh, synergistic value there. I think if they can go through a single processing pipeline, um, I think there's an opportunity to deliver more value. So um, we just launched a beta um, a program for our streams last month. Um, and so we're starting to work with customers now on, on figuring out how streams can um, fit a lot of these workloads in, in larger organizations. And so broadly, what we're, what we're seeing is that it's not just about logs and metrics and you know, pre-processing. We're really seeing an evolving ecosystem that we're calling observability data management. And so we're thinking about era streams really as being this um, central hub for all of your observability data. Um, if you as an organization are thinking about um, sources of metrics, sources of logs, how that data is flowing, you know, through a processing pipeline, how it's being, um, you know, durably delivered to these other destinations, and it needs to be, it needs to be efficient, and also needs to be fast. If you're looking for real-time observability, you know, and your processing pipeline is adding five or ten minutes of processing latency, that's that's not 
not acceptable. It needs to be, you know, sub second processing times. It needs to be effectively processing data in real time as it's coming through. And so uh, what we what what we, we sort of anticipate is going to happen is that as these data volumes continue to grow over the next few years, this the, the observability pipeline or the telemetry pipeline piece is going to actually start to become a critical part of not only cost management, but of just operational management for observability platforms. And so this comes down to how do you manage configuration changes? How do you do, how do you roll back? How do you look at who made what change when? Um, and how do you efficiently roll out these changes within your organization, you know, either through, you know, GitOps or a CICD kind of workflow, um, because there, there's going to be a breaking point with, with just traditional agents where, you know, deploying all these configurations, managing all these configurations is no longer um, easy enough uh, for organizations to, um, to operationalize. And it's going to start leading to more and more, more problems, more outages. And the most important part of observability from our perspective is that it needs to be the most reliable part of this entire system, because if it's not, you can't make sure that you're uh, that your business is functioning, that your other tools are functioning, that your other systems are functioning. And so getting getting this piece right and getting this to be something that can be uh, easily operationalized, scaled up uh, effortlessly, and you know having having as close to one hundred percent uptime as possible uh, within you know, realistic constraints in you know whatever environment you're running in uh, is actually really critical. And so um, our our view on it also is that the stream processing piece or the observability pipeline piece is great. But what we really want to be able to bring also is the storage technology as well. And that's where we feel like the uh, interaction between era streams and era search is actually really important for us as we're talking to customers. The, the storage piece solves kind of a fundamental uh, cost and scale issue of where do, I, where do I put this data and how do I keep it around for as long as I need to without worrying about um, exponential cost increases. And that's something that we're starting to see with folks that have been running Elasticsearch for a while is it's getting harder and harder to manage uh, these growing data volumes because at, at a certain point, there's sort of, there, there are some fundamental limits to what that architecture is capable of handling um, without starting, starting to introduce a lot of operational complexity and a lot of uh, potential failures. And so the storage piece coupled with the observability pipeline piece really starts to create this um, holistic picture where you can have all of your data flowing in. We don't really care where you want it to go. If you want it to go into era search, that's great. We're happy to support that. But if you are a big Splunk shop, you're not gonna stop using Splunk just because something's cheaper because you, you built your business, you built your dashboards around Splunk and we still wanna be able to let you easily send data to Splunk. But there are a lot of customers we talk to who don't need to be putting all of the data into Splunk or don't need to be putting as much data into Splunk as they're, they're currently doing. And so having a, uh, cost-effective scalable storage technology um, starts to make it possible to think about what does it look like to stratify um, these these logs in terms of uh, value or, or business value um, and think about what's the right place for this data to live long term and having a tool that can really manage all of the, the filtering, routing, transformation, aggregation, deduplication um, in, in a single tool uh, makes that that world, that that view of the world, uh, very possible. And so, just looking a little bit at that, the um, the era search piece, and just sort of our very high level uh, architectural overview. So, you know, we've we've done a lot of work to scale um, our ability to ingest data efficiently on the storage tier, and that also relates to the the same way that we think about. Um, uh, ingest and, and efficiency in, in era streams as well in the observability pipeline piece. Uh, but the, the critical thing for us that we've uh, embraced from the very beginning is, you know, having separation of storage and compute built in, being able to have the ability to store, um, you know, data, whether it's for our archives or compliance or security um, in some sort of cold storage tier like S3 or GCS or, or Minio, um, being able to leverage uh, high durability, low cost storage for data that gets relatively infrequently accessed, but also have that tied into a dynamically um, a dynamically rebalanced caching tier for hot storage. So in, in era search, everything that comes in gets automatically persisted to object storage and uh, is available immediately in, in our caching tier. And so 
you, the user, don't need to think about what does it mean for data to go from hot to cold, because in reality, all the data is already in cold. The only thing that gets managed for you is what data stays in hot, how much caching, uh, you know, caching capacity is available, what rules do you have set around, you know, time-based eviction, and, um, you know, essentially that data just gets flushed out of hot storage when the, the time is appropriate. And then if you need to query against data that's in cold storage, that just automatically gets pulled back into hot storage through a, a rehydration process and is immediately available for querying. So that that piece is a you know a fundamental architectural separation, um, but again is is essentially transparent to to you as the user. And then um, you know having built a query engine on top of that, that makes that entire process transparent um, to uh, to you as a user. Um, uh, and then we've also done a lot of work to build. Um, some some API endpoints that mirror what you'd see in Elasticsearch. So whether it's um, ingest or query, we can actually work with a lot of tools that uh, work directly with Elasticsearch. So you know you can use the our backend as a Grafana data source. You can use Logstash, ingest data, or Telegraph, or Vector. Any of these tools work automatically. And so again, this sort of a lot of these properties are things that we've been backing up into the observability pipeline piece, realizing that. Um, having that ability to support those inputs and outputs and be able to do that processing in the in the pipeline tier is really important. So I think finding a lot of these um, just sort of like design goals that we've built into the storage piece um, and focusing on those within the pipeline piece uh, has, has been a big part of, of our design goals as we build this entire system. And so looking at, at era streams versus, certainly versus, um, you know, building your own thing, uh, we've tried to find the hardest parts of that and solve for those as we build error streams. Um, so being able to scale easily. So, you know, th this really comes down to uh, if you don't have to think about managing your own fleet of agents, if you don't have to think about managing the capacity of your own queue, um, that's something that we've we've built into the product that is, is relatively straightforward from a from a management perspective and something that you know i think should be essentially table stakes for um observability tooling like the scale should be there the ability to handle uh bursts and ingest and be able to to provide um you know reasonable and efficient back pressure when necessary uh all is built into the product dynamic reconfiguration is probably the biggest and so in this is when you apply a configuration change to era streams the pipeline itself never goes offline um, those changes get updated uh, automatically across every every worker in the in the fleet, um, and you don't have to think about downtime. You don't have to think about what it means to to make a change because the system handles that all automatically, and that includes um, you know intermediate processing that needs to be finished. Um, anything anything that may come along that with with what you would consider normally having to like restart a process uh for an agent to pick up a new configuration change and so again going back to this there are definitely some tools that will allow you to just do uh you know a, a a non just like a heads up kind of restart um and trigger trigger a configuration reload um but if you have to do that across you know 100 different agents that are all running simultaneously how do you manage the timing how do you manage the synchronization um, and that's something that we've we've put a lot of work into with Aero Streams, and then really ease of use. Um, we've got a, a UI that we've been working on. I'll show a, a screenshot of that in a minute. Um, but uh, thinking about what it's like for you as a user um, to define inputs and outputs, for you to uh, figure out what data flows where, for you to get insights into uh, whether your pipeline is running. Um, all I think all of those things factor into. Uh, how how you as a, an operator going to use this tool, and how you want to surface this to other folks inside of your organization. So being able to see, you know, potentially the ability to build these pipelines without having to think about, um, you know, really writing writing code or having to, you know, I guess YAML for for most people it may or may not be considered code, but even being able to step one level above that and have um, have a tool that lets you build some of these uh, configurations for these pipelines visually. Um, and so really the idea here is make this system sort of a, uh, a data processing fabric, really targeted observability data. So taking a lot of the other potential use cases off the table, focus on observability and make it something that scales like you would expect, uh, has change management like you would expect and becomes a, a critical part of your observability infrastructure, knowing that everything that's flowing in, everything that's flowing out 
has has strong durability guarantees and and basically does does what you would expect. Um, and then I mentioned this earlier, but having the um, you know integration with Era Search again, it's not a mandated integration. We just have uh, obviously done a lot of work to make sure that that's as seamless as possible. But being able to have a low cost storage option. Um, is something we think is really important as you start to think about rolling out observability pipelines and thinking about managing your entire organization's observability data workloads. And then the ability to, to leverage that error search piece to really get a uh, petabyte scale search across, across all of your logs and having a place that, you know, unlike just dumping data into S3, gives you the ability to, um, to run queries um, use it in, in a real-time manner if you if you choose. You can use it for archival purposes. Really, whatever you need to do, uh, Era Search opens that up for you and, and makes it easy to get data from Era Streams into Era Search um, and and have a tool that can let you manage all the all those workloads in a cost-effective way. Um, and then just a couple things on on benefits um, for Era Streams. This probably is all relatively obvious based on the things that we've said. Um, but a huge part of this is being able to reduce costs. Um, you know, you can do some work to either um, remove data in flight from your log streams. Some some folks like the idea of removing data. Some people just want to be able to store everything. And regardless, you can do um, you can do either with Aero streams, um, but you can use Aero streams to route data to the the platforms that are the most efficient for you. So again, coming back to Splunk, uh, you know, if you could reduce the data that you're sending to Splunk by half, that could potentially be significant cost savings. And by being able to bring something else, whether it's Elasticsearch or whether it's Era Search, or you know, maybe, maybe you want to use Datadog for some of that, um, being able to route the data to the right place and efficiently build those rules that decides what data goes where. Um, but really with the goal of you know, not necessarily, um, not just saving money, but being able to efficiently optimize how you're spending that money. Um, taking action on data and flight, uh, again, you know, I mentioned that you really, as an observability pipeline, you want to be able to have this data be effectively processed in real time so that you're not adding a lot of latency to your observability data as it's coming into the system. So really being able to, um, you know, do transformations, enrichment, uh, deduplication, whatever it is, um, on the data as it's passing through the system before it lands in your, in your storage uh, destination. Uh, and then again, effortlessly managing data at scale. Um, this is something that needs to work at, at high scale, needs to be able to scale up for those, those organizations that are envisioning, you know, two to five X uh, log volume growth in the next year. Uh, this needs to be something that works now and is going to work at 10 X or 50 X its current size, uh, because that's, that's the world that we're heading into is, you know, probably by the next uh, you know, by the end of this decade, I think the log volumes that we're doing now will seem silly in comparison, and everybody will probably be doing 10 times as much data as, as they're doing now. So we need to be able to build and deploy a set of tools that will scale uh, with, those, with those data challenges as organizations grow. And I, I promised you a screen a screenshot. I was going to try and squeeze a demo in here, but I don't think I, I left myself enough time. But really, uh, this is uh, just an overview of what the AeroStreams configuration UI looks like. Uh, again, we're thinking about this as uh, basically a flow chart. Um, you have a set of, uh, of input sources. And on this one, we basically just got a Splunk HTTP event collector input um, that can take data, drop some fields, you can forward the, the rest of that data on to Era Search or any other destination, but then you can also you know, fork the data off and you can have a second, second stream there that maybe goes through, through some additional filtering step. And maybe the ultimate destination here is that you've dropped some fields and you store all the raw data in Era Search. Cool, that's, that's efficient. Um, but then you also want to peel off some of that data and you want to just uh, strip out all of the logs that, have, that are log level error. Um, and you want to only store those in a, in a different system. And so maybe that's a good thing for you to be putting into your Splunk system, or maybe those are the ones that you send to Datadog. Uh, but Era Streams lets you efficiently decide and route uh, all that data into whatever, uh, whatever destinations you want and be able to quickly visualize what's going where, make changes on the fly. And then once you've uh, made your changes, you can just hit save and deploy it automatically to your Aerostream's um, 
infrastructure and that configuration change will get picked up automatically. Um, and there's another another view here that I don't have a screenshot for, but you know, a relatively simple uh, change history. So you can go back and look and see who made the most recent change. Maybe something stopped working or maybe you stopped seeing logs that you were, were hoping to see in Datadog. Um, you can go back and, and, and roll back to those previous configuration changes and deploy those uh, automatically as well. And so the idea here is that this, this view gives you the ability to not only configure easily, but also to make and visualize these changes, visualize pipeline health um, and rapidly uh, configure and deploy these changes so that you can you can start to get um, get data processing quickly. Um, and then another thing we didn't touch on, and I'll say one last thing is an important part of this is being able to do to apply some rules here for PII redaction and things like that. So if you know that you've got systems that maybe have more general access within your organization, um, you can have one data source that has PII redacted data that a broader part of your organization has access to. And then you can have one that's unredacted and maybe only a set of administrators or a set of um, you know, higher authorization users have access to. And that's actually a great use for a tool like Aris Streams. Um, it's not something that is super complicated, but you want to be able to visualize, oh, this flow is going here and it's got my redaction steps and I want to be able to see that those are working. And then I've got this flow over here that's got my my raw data. Uh, make sure it's going to the right place and make sure that it's, it's doing what you expect. And then down below, we've just got a, a log viewer. You can hop into really any stage in the pipeline and see uh, a sample of what the logs are that are flowing through that, that part of the system. And I'm pretty close to time, so I'm going to wrap up here. Um, so we have been... Uh, as I mentioned, we open up a, a beta program for Aero Streams. Um, there's a link here. I think you guys should get provided a, a link to that as well. If you're interested in, in checking out Aero Streams, definitely reach out to us. Again, you know, no, uh, no, no shame if you want to build your own, um, but just keep in mind that there are a lot of things that you have to do and manage. Uh, we would love to to help you. Uh, ha have an easier life and help you manage those with Aero Streams. Uh, but definitely sign up if you're interested and uh, we'll find some time to chat. And I actually don't see any questions in the Q&A box. So maybe I've just done a fantastic job talking for 50 minutes. I'll give people like one more second to see if anything pops up. And if there's nothing else, I will hand it back over to the Linux Foundation. Thank you so much, Todd, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope that you join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day.